Good afternoon. Welcome to another episode of Parks Place Perspective. Today is August 22nd, 2012. My name is Chad Simmons. I'm with the Greater Falls Prevention Coordinator, or Prevention Coalition. I'm the media coordinator for the organization. Uh, today on Parks Place Perspective, we're really excited to have a, a dynamic program and a, a special guest that will have a, an opportunity to converse with today. Uh, the vision of the Greater Falls Prevention Coalition is to nurture healthy, happy families in the community. And it's our mission to promote fun, uh, healthy activities for youth and adults uh, throughout the community, as well as to promote a comprehensive prevention plan to reduce and prevent substance abuse within the Wyndham Northeast uh, Supervisory Union. Um, today's program is reducing tobacco um, and secondhand smoke within our homes and our apartments. And I think this is a really um, important issue to, to discuss and we'll be working more on as an organization, as a community um, moving forward. Um, we'll take a look at the impact and consequences of tobacco use and misuse. Um, and we're also very fortunate to have Paul Stewart from Stewart Property Management. He's gonna be on the show talking a little bit about um, their business, how they got started, and as well as how they approach uh, tobacco um, communication and policy within uh, the organization. So first, let's take a look at some of the facts here um, regarding tobacco use and the implications, the health implications of, of tobacco use. Um, according to the most recent data from the Centers for Disease Control, um, cigarette smoking causes one in five deaths within the United States. Um, that's nearly half a million people uh, every year um, die from cigarette smoke. Um, and 50,000 of those deaths per year are from secondhand smoke. Um, nearly 300,000 of those deaths are, um, are, uh, are men and 200,000 of those are female. Um, so more locally, um, we're looking at um, the health, the youth risk, um, the youth risk behavior survey, which is administered by the state every two years. And here locally, 33% of the Bellows Falls Union High School students um, have said they've smoked at least once. Um, and 11% said they smoked, they started smoking before the age of 13. Um, so of those uh, that said they smoked, 45% said they got those from someone over the age of 18. Um, so what can we do in our community, here in the Greater Falls community, uh, about smoking and secondhand smoke exposure? Um, well, recently, uh, actually within the last two weeks, the Greater Falls Prevention Coalition just recently hired a tobacco coordinator that's going to be working as a community outreach specialist, specialist um, with the town of Rockingham and in the, the Greater Falls community, with local businesses and organizations, as well as looking at the municipal er our municipal areas and parks um, to look at how we can decrease uh, secondhand smoke exposure and help those dealing with uh, smoking addictions to uh, find some help. And on that line, um, there are ways to help support those in the community dealing with um, tobacco addiction. Uh, one of those ways is the Vermont Quit Line, um, and that is uh, that number is 877-YES-QUIT. Again, that's the Vermont Quit Line, which is 877-YES-QUIT. Um, that's just one resource available to those in the community that are dealing with um, tobacco addiction and looking to, to quit smoking. Um, so here with us today, uh, we've got Paul Stewart. Uh, he's the owner of Pr uh, Stewart Property Management, and uh, he's here to talk a little bit about the history of um, the, the business and some of the smoke-free policies that they have. Uh, so I'd like to welcome to the show Paul Stewart. Thanks for joining us today, Paul. Thank you. My uh, pleasure. It's really great to have you here and um, have this dialogue, and so the, the rest of the community can kind of hear a little bit about what your business um, does and um, within Vermont and New Hampshire and kind of a little bit about the role that you play within tobacco prevention. Um, so why don't we start first start off and, and learn a little bit more about the business, um, Stewart Property Management, and um, tell us a little bit about it. Well, Stewart Property Management is uh, actually located in Bedford, New Hampshire. Uh, we started the business 24 years and three months ago, <laughs> so next year will be our 25th anniversary. Oh, that's great. We manage exclusively uh, lower income, affordable housing, subsidized housing, if you will, using a plethora of federal housing programs um, that are available or were available. 
Uh, in, uh, in Vermont, we manage 25 properties, uh, six in the Bellows Falls uh, area alone. Our flagship property in Bellows Falls is the Rockingham Canal House. Mm -hmm. We were fortunate enough to purchase that property three years ago and, and just now completing a $2.5 million renovation uh, for this property for low-income seniors and, and the disabled. We're very, very proud of it. Which many of us last last week uh, for the the Greater Falls Chamber Mixer, you housed or you you hosted the event, and many of us got to, to get to see kind of firsthand the the uh, the space and the beautiful inside and the murals. And um, so, do you, would you want to talk a little bit about kind of that building in particular? Um, in that, the building originally was a hotel when it was first built in 1883. Uh, the uh, owner at the time was L. T. Lovell. Two, I only know that because his name is uh, inscribed in slate on the mansard roof as well as the date of, of construction. Mm -hmm. It was a hotel at the time. Over the years, it served the, uh, the uh, population coming in by train. Um, over time, I, I think the hotel declined. Uh, a theater was per uh, built in the back of, of the hotel. Mm -hmm. Eventually, it ended up in, in disrepair. And I, according to the, one of the prior owners that I spoke to last week, was actually scheduled for demolition, but it was oh, saved um, because it was deemed to be a precious resource in downtown. Uh, we came upon th the management of the property. It was converted into elderly housing in 1983. We started managing it about five years ago, fortunate enough to be able to purchase it three years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, even more fortunate, uh, we were able to get uh, very, very favorable uh, financing to undertake the substantial renovation of the building. It's a very, very handsome building with a six-story atrium, yeah. um, very dramatic, and, uh, and we've renovated the units uh, inside as well as doing a number of exterior improvements, um, and uh, including uh, a, a good deal of artwork uh, mm -hmm. by way of murals on various walls in the building that depict uh, and illustrate the history of the community and some of its traditions. Yeah, which I, I recommend people uh, taking a look at because I thought they were really interesting to, to take a look yeah. and see kind of the, the uh, artistic um, rendering of, you know, exactly what yeah. the community was like. Awesome. Um, so y y tell us a little bit about actually, um, I'm curious, and you and I were talking about this beforehand, a little bit about um, why you chose to get into um, specifically affordable housing um, and you know, the need within the, the Greater Falls community. And, that, you know, I, when we say Greater Falls community, too, we, we mean New Hampshire just because mm -hmm. we're, we're such close neighbors, especially in this community. Yeah. Well, I, um, I started my work career at the Department of Housing and Urban Development in Manchester, New Hampshire, which had jurisdiction over Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont for affordable housing programs. And um, I worked there for 14 years, 14 mostly very, very good years mm -hmm. when there was a good deal of uh, housing development um, you know, uh, among the three states. And that was really very fulfilling for me because I grew up in the 60s and growing up in the 60s, uh, there was a feeling amongst those uh, at that time that uh, doing good was doing well. Mm -hmm. And uh, so for me, you know, being in, in that career and then subsequently in the property management business of affordable housing, uh, it enabled me to stay in the housing business and provide or provide a resource for those who who are unable to afford housing on their own so it's been you know for me it's been very very rewarding rewarding yes. exactly yeah. exactly um, so let's let's talk a little bit about how um, Stuart properties approaches the use of cigarettes um, in, in your properties and specifically do you have um, do you have policies set in a place and you know if so how are they communicated and kind of what role do you see yourself as, as a property manager um, and, and, and renter uh, or rent, um, and rental, you know, in charge of rental properties playing in, in cigarette, in the decreasing cigarette smoke? Well, we've been thinking about it for some time actually because uh, in, in much of it was self serving uh, because the, um, the effects of secondhand smoke uh, on our employees uh, and on other residents mm -hmm. uh, has become a growing, growing concern, now okay. becoming the subject of, of litigation. Uh, mm. From a real estate perspective, uh, what we find in apartments where there are smokers is, is the cost to turn over those units when the smoker leaves is, is two to three times really? what okay. it costs to turn over a, a non-smoker uh, unit. And, um, 
and not to mention the you know the effects on the employees who have to work in that unit. Mm -hmm. So, the in addition to that, uh, we have an ever growing demand, or we did have an ever growing demand among residents who are very sensitive to secondhand smoke to transfer to other units in the development to avoid a smoker who might be nearby, and that's very costly because then you end up having to turn over two units instead of one unit. Uh, okay. Uh, and moreover, you can't guarantee to the to the uh, the, the person who's sensitive that uh, there won't be another smoker who would arrive, you know, in that vicinity in the mm -hmm. future. So that really didn't work very well. Um, so we've been uh, thinking about the whole smoking thing for some time. We mm -hmm. experimented. We started off experimenting with a few properties by prohibiting smoking in the apartments, but allowing smoking outside the building. Right in some cases in the vehicle, in the resident's vehicle, or mm -hmm. in a designated area. Uh, we found out, fortunately through experimentation, uh, that that really didn't work. Okay. Um, that those who are non-smokers are very, very sensitive to it, perhaps unduly so. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Once you adopt the policy, even on an experimental basis, then people don't want to be anywhere near the smokers. So. Through that experimentation, we um, decided that if we were going to uh, adopt a non-smoking policy for our properties, which we have for all of our properties in Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, Massachusetts, with the exception of one hmm, okay. where the owner chose not to, that, uh, that if we were going to adopt that policy, that it would be no smoking, uh, not only in the apartment, but anywhere on the property itself. On the property, okay. And uh, that is our policy. We uh, we in, we initiated that policy some 18 months ago. We phased it in, okay. Because from a legal perspective, we had to wait for leases to expire so that we could introduce language in the lease agreements with residents that would prohibit the smoking in the areas any anywhere on the property grounds. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have implemented it. It's been uh, fully implemented now, and. Uh, and we've had uh, very good success with it. We okay. do have we do have uh, a few residents who are stubborn holdouts, mm -hmm. and uh, and we actually do have a an eviction case pending in Vermont right mm -hmm. now at a property where uh, the resident he says he won't smoke in the apartment. He's willing to abide by that, but he insists on smoking on the on the grounds mm -hmm. of the property. So uh, we'll see how that goes. We're right. not getting a good deal of cooperation from. Uh, the uh, from the legal side uh, mm -hmm. in terms of uh, terms of trying to work that through but so well first I, I guess I want to thank you you know for the work that you're doing and kind of looking at this in terms of a holistic approach and you know obviously as you said if you know it first came out about by this was more or less a, you know kind of a business decision that it seemed like was necessary um, but it sounds like, and you know, I, I know you and Deb Whitkiss, who's our parent outreach coordinator, have kind of talked about this as the balancing act between being compassionate for those that do rent from you um, and f finding a balance between um, understanding that they have an addiction and that they, um, um, you know, need to smoke s sometimes, um, but also understanding that those residents that have an aversion to, to cigarette smoke or ha for other health issues and the, the danger it plays for them as well. Um, so can you talk about how you've been able to kind of work with your tenants uh, within your properties and, and how, how you communicated some of these and what were some of the things that worked, what didn't seem to work and kind of like how you see yourself moving forward with that? When we, when we decided to implement the, um, the policy at a particular property, we first of all gave the residents lots of notice. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't a situation where we said, well, from 30 days from now, this is the way it's going to be. We gave them anywhere. Some properties got a year's notice. Okay. Um, because as I mentioned, we had to stagger the uh, introduction based on lease expiration. So we gave residents plenty of notice. Um, we did offer educational programs mm -hmm. where they were available. Um, some residents were willing to at least listen. Uh, at first, you know, I think the, the smoker population was pretty militant about mm -hmm. the idea of having this restriction imposed on them. There was the whole freedom. I should yeah. be able to do what I want right. to do. And uh, we had meetings with the residents. We had group meetings with the residents to explain the policy and why we were doing it, um, to try to let them know that it was rationally based, that we weren't trying to um, we weren't trying to dictate their lifestyle, 
that we weren't telling them that they had to quit smoking, um, that they were free to do that, but we had an obligation to the property, we had an obligation to the other residents to, um, to prohibit the smoking on the grounds of the property. Hmm. And uh, many really actually understood that. Um, some didn't and, and some still don't. Right. Um, and we have offered not only the educational classes, but in some cases we've actually told a few residents that we'd even, even pay for the electronic cigarettes to help them hmm. for a period of time to help them wean themselves off if they would make an honest effort to, to use them. And, um, and all of that's been very good. Okay. Um, we were very concerned when we implemented it that, um, that the imposition of that as a, as a condition of occupancy, that would, it, would con it would diminish the demand for the housing units, that we would lose potential applicants. Um, there were studies that have been done in Michigan that concluded to the contrary, so we hmm. decided to take that leap of faith uh, because we do have some properties where waiting lists are very short and um, we didn't want to do anything that would create vacancies and make more problems for the real estate. So, uh, but that has not been a problem. Uh, we have uh, applicants who are drawn to the property because of the yeah, non-smoking yeah. policy. And actually it's the non-smokers who tend to be the, uh, the greatest enforcers of the policy because mm -hmm. they're the first ones to tell us uh, when there's a transgressor. <laughs> right, right. And that's, that's actually um, interesting you mentioned that because I think uh, a fair amount of our work is based on changing the norms within the community um, and, and finding a way to compassionately and positively do that. And I think by having your peers, you know, the people that you live with, um, whether it be in uh, a larger home or in a rental properties, kind of kind of communicate that that's not okay to do something and it's harmful for others, I think can be a way um, for the community as a whole to, to, to be able to address um, dangerous activities like cigarette smoke. Um, so what are some of the, what's some of the feedback that you got, you, you've received from, um, from tenants kind of moving forward and are, you know, are people taking advantage of some of the the resources that you've offered, um, you know, wh what's worked, what hasn't, and where do you see yourself going from this point forward? Well, I think the, um, I think the educational part has worked. I mean, it's not a panacea for, for everyone. Yeah. Um, there are the stubborn, stubborn holdouts, but we have lots of um, cases of, that we could point to where people have said, gee, I've always wanted to quit. I really never had the will to do so, now I'm forced to do it because I don't want to leave my housing. I don't want to lose my housing. And uh, we've had many cases where the children of, in the case of senior housing particularly, where the children have come in and have been very supportive of the, of the whole uh, initiative. Mm, okay. And that has, has worked very well. We really disdain having to use the stick part yeah. of the program, yeah. which is the lease enforcement. Um, but people have to understand what the implications are that the secondhand smoke danger uh, residents, and now that residents are coming to these properties in some measure because they are non-smoking, they insist on enforcement. They want to make sure that we're not just talking about it, that we'll, if we, if we have to, if push comes to shove, that we'll do something about it. And, uh, you know, so it's an unpleasant aspect of the equation, but, you know, for that very small minority that just absolutely refuses to cooperate with us, that's, you know, that's where we have to go. With right, it. right. And uh, we actually have not, we haven't perfected an eviction yet yeah. uh, in the three states. We've had a few residents who have left because they refuse to abide by the policy. And they just, on their own and they accord. Leave, they leave on their own accord. Okay. And so be it. Mm -hmm. um, as far as what doesn't work, as I mentioned before, um, permitting the smoking anywhere on the property okay. or having designated areas, it, it, it just doesn't work because mm -hmm. The, the non-smokers tend to be, like I said, uh, very, very sensitive to, mm. to the whole smoke thing. And then the other thing I would say as far as what pushed us over the edge as far as the, the, the non-smoking policy is that there's litigation now that's out there uh, whereby owners have been, are being held responsible for failure to protect the, the interests mm. of the, hmm. the non-smokers and particularly in the realm of secondhand smoke. And so, you know, for, for that reason and the others, you know, for us, you know, it was something that, that had to be done. It just made sense. Yeah, it yeah. made sense. And it really has been very, very good. And 
I, frankly, I think over the next few years, um, there will be more and more properties that will be non-smoking. And I'll be surprised, at least in the universe in which I work, which is mm. the affordable housing universe, where people are, tend to be, frankly, a little more conscious of, mm. you know, the, of the social objective. I think you'll find next five years, I bet virtually 100% of those properties will be uh, non-smoking. So that actually segues into one of my last questions. What, what kind of support are you seeing? You know, are there federal or state programs or support systems that, to help you do this? Because, I mean, when you're explaining this to me, this seems like a pretty arduous, you know, a, a pretty large task for you to accomplish, especially knowing that you have so many properties. So, you know, are there, are there ways of, you know, systems of support, either federally, state, locally? Um, the, um, the support systems we're getting primarily are out of the state. Um, for instance, in New Hampshire, uh, there's a, a, a nonprofit that's actually a spinoff of, of a state agency that deals with smoking cessation. cessation. Uh, they've done a number of educational programs mm -hmm. for us. They actually, when it comes to the enforcement, they actually have uh, equipment that they'll bring to an apartment wow. and test the air quality. And, uh, and we use that documentation to show residents that who claim they're not smoking, well, this is what the results show hmm. in bar graph form. So, um, you know, and that has been very, very helpful. Limited funding on the state level, yeah. you know, constrains that resource. Um, so, you know, to a great extent, you know, we're we're doing this on our own, but we do we do appreciate the the support we can get. Right, right. Yeah. When hopefully moving forward, the Greater Falls Prevention Coalition can, in some way, kind of help continue to support your efforts to to provide smoke free environments. Yeah, for I folks. mean, we're counting on it. I know at the Canal House that we're you know we're making arrangements with the with the coalition to come over and do an educational program for the residents, and you know we're hoping that that serves the purpose of serving as a support mechanism for those who don't smoke who want to help the smokers right. uh, as well as just providing the raw education in terms of trying to bring this into a rational process um, so that smokers will understand that we're, you know, we're, not, we're not doing this to make their lives miserable. Exactly. We're really exactly. Not, so. Well, Paul, thank you so much for being on the show today. We really appreciate the time uh, spending with us, spending some time with us today, and for all the work that you're doing to, to pr you know, provide healthy environments for folks. Uh, so, thank you. You're welcome. Great. Thanks for inviting me. So, next up, we'll uh, run right into our Healthy Retailer of the Month. So, the Healthy Retailer program is set up through the state of Vermont, um, as well as done by local prevention coalitions to promote and support area retailers that are providing fresh, local, and affordable food options and decreasing the amount of tobacco and alcohol advertising within their stores. So over the last uh, few months, we've been highlighting some of the stores within our community that have been doing a great job already. Um, and uh, this month, uh, moving into September, we're going to be highlighting the Saxton's River Village Market, located in Saxton's River, and the owner, Avril Larson, who I had a chance to sit down with uh, a little uh, a couple of weeks ago and chat about her business, the little, little history behind the business, and what makes a healthy retailer. So let's check that out. I'm Avril Larson. We're at the Saxton's River Village Market in Saxton's River, Vermont. Um, a great store to shop in. It's got all kinds of different products from wonderful breads, um, different kinds of foods from around the world, and also some very local foods. So how did you get started in running and owning this market? Well actually I'm a chef and so really my experience is as a chef. <clears throat> so I food is my my world so running a store is just part of all of that. Okay, okay. And, and you not only run this market, but you also uh, run the inn as well, correct? My husband yeah. and I run the Saxons River Inn, okay. and I'm the chef over there, and I have um, another woman who helps me in the kitchen there. What do you enjoy most about running this, this particular market? This particular market is great because it's actually in, the, in a little village where there, there are no other stores, so it is fun. We get to see everybody. We get to talk to everybody. Um, you know way too much about everybody, um, but that's fun too sometimes. 
but you know you basically can buy for the for the people who use the store what they want because they continue to come back they are we have huge repeat customers right. and it's great to be able to do that for them so actually and talk a little bit more about kind of the role this market plays as kind of you know a, a community center if you will or a community hub um, you know I, I know that's that's kind of been a part of the market, um, you know, the history of the markets in Vermont, but kind of talk about... Well, markets always in Vermont have been part of the community, and as we, the small markets disappear, um, this market is great that it's still here, people do support it, it's um, very important, we do give out a lot of information and we do help a lot of people, um, we try to... Um, um, deal with emergencies as they arise. Mm -hmm. um, Hurricane Irene, we did a lot of stuff for people to try and help them to keep themselves together. Um, and yet at the same time, we also lost our food during Hurricane Irene. So it's a, you know, it's kind of you try to do what you can. And uh, the employees here are fabulous. They help anybody do anything. It's, it's a really good little area and spot yeah. to do that. Yeah. What are some of the challenges that you find in running this retail outlet market? Um, the, the challenges are you always need more business so in order to survive. So every small store needs more business to survive. Um, that's just part of your world as a rule in, in business in, as gen, in general. Um, the other challenges are um, it's a, you have to stay on top of everything every minute. And sometimes that's more difficult than you would like it to be. Um, you you do have issues in the store with people who want to take things and do things differently than you would like to do it. So um, you know you're always trying to be on top of that, and at the same time keep them as customers. So what have you found to be one of the um, the, the aspects that you found to be successful? Like the stuff you know something that works for having those repeat customers. And uh, making the business as itself. long as you have the product they'll keep coming back if that's the product they want and, um, what, and, what would and, that be? and sometimes it will be vegetables sometimes it will be things from different places in the world that nobody else around carries mm. um, we do have um, a lot of things that other people don't seem to have so it it is kind of a spot where people come to look for certain little things that some little oddities um, and because I'm a chef I have those because I want them to cook with, right. so I keep them for me and for them. But we also try to do um, local vegetables as much as we can um, when they're available. Um, we do have um, specialty suppliers for different things. Mm -hmm. um, it's not always easy to get the specialty stuff, right. but you know, more and more people want it as it's called for. Mm -hmm. we, we can get it. Um, we do have a meat case. Um, we used to have um, a lot more organic local meat, but it doesn't, it's expensive, and that right now doesn't seem to be what we can sell here. We do have other meat, and we have very good meat, but most of it is not organic mm -hmm. as such. Um, a lot of it's natural, but not organic. Right. Mm -hmm. And we do always have organic chickens, um, and lots of times organic pork, but other than that, um, it's it's hard yeah because yeah. it's not we're not a bustling community we're a busy community but not a bustling one a distinction yeah. so, so yeah. it sounds like you've been really successful at kind of catering to what the community needs yeah we try to cater to what they need and I'm glad to always get whatever they need as long as we can sell it it's right, fine right yeah and obviously when you walk into the store the first thing you see is more of like the fresh food options. That right, you, you see have. the fresh food, you see the meat counter, you see the vegetables on the counter. You, we make a lot of um, cookies and bars and things like that and a lot of breakfast things. And yeah. you do see that. But we also do have wine and beer. And we do have cigarettes, but we have a very small selection of cigarettes. We do not um, um, advertise them. And um, they are there for people to buy, but it's pretty limited. Right. But we do feel that most of the food here is is basically pretty healthy. Yeah. So what would what would you say your rationale was or is for not advertising um, well, any of your tobacco products or uh, your alcohol products? Well, I think that um, 
the tobacco, I, I, I'm really more of a food person and I really don't want the tobacco to, to overcome what I like to do, which has to do with food. Wine obviously is my interest, so yes, we do have it. Um, and as a store, you really need to have it in order to um, you know, survive. Yeah. yeah. Um, but the tobacco isn't uh, what I plan to, you know, it's not going to make or break the store. I'd right. rather make or break it with food and hope that everybody shops for food. Right, yeah. In the, in the, <laughs> the, the advertising part of it, you realize that some of your customers, you know, are looking for tobacco products. Right, they're going to have tobacco products and they're going to get them no matter where they are. So you might as well have them to make it convenient to them. Right, but, that's but you, really more you made a conscious right. decision right. not to advertise that. Right, I do not advertise. Don't, I'm just not particularly comfortable just having adverti cigarette advertising all over the store and right. that's what tobacco companies want you to do and I don't choose to do that. So can you talk about where you see the market going like in the future, you know, where do you see this, this market? Well, I hope the market can stay here because it's a great market. It's um, really important to this community. Um, where it would go to, I would hope it would stay somewhat the same and be able to have uh, the, the produce, the, the meats, the um, and we have a big frozen section because you have to have that today. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I would hope that it would all just continue and that we can keep the small market as a small market. We can't expand, we have no room to expand, so we are what we are. Yeah. Um, and keep it as a, as a place in the community that is important. And that was Avril Larson from the Saxons River Village Market. And I want to thank her again for taking the time to uh, chat with me about being a healthy retailer. So um, as we close up here, let me just run through quickly what we've got coming up with the Greater Falls Prevention Coalition. Uh, we've recently put together our action team. So if those in the community are interested in kind of joining our efforts and taking a, a direct look at what we can do to prevent uh, substance abuse, specifically around alcohol, tobacco, uh, marijuana, specifically around teens, and uh, how we can get that, those things rocking and rolling. Uh, give us a call or stop by the uh, start by our office, which is located, of course, in Parks Place. Um, our website um, for everyone, uh, just to make sure everyone knows, is at GFPC and the line .org, and our phone number is 802. 463-9927. Um, every Thursday morning from 8 until 9 a.m., we've got Coffee Connection with Deb Whitkiss, who's the Parent Outreach Coordinator. Good time, opportunity for parents to chit-chat and connect on what's happening in their lives. So st um, definitely stop by every Thursday morning for Coffee Connection at Parks Place from 8 to 9 a.m. Uh, we're also partnering with some area residents and uh, organizations, the town of Rockingham, the Wyndham Farm to Food Network, Post Oil Solutions, our place to promote the Buyers Club, which is an opportunity for those um, who can't usually or, or have difficulty affording affordable, uh, uh, affordable food options and local fresh food options to buy these, um, these items from local producers and farmers. So feel free to contact us if you're interested in that. Um, if you are low income or need assistance with that, feel free to give us a call um, at Parks Place. Again, 463-9927. Um, our September coalition meeting is coming up on uh, Friday, September 21st from noon to 1.30. Uh, we'll be talking a lot about prescription drug abuse and uh, how folks can get involved in those efforts. And speaking of prescription drug abuse, we're going to be um, doing uh, a lot of work leading up to September 29th, which is the Prescription uh, Drug Take Back Day, an opportunity for folks to bring in their old or unused or expired prescription drugs. Um, uh, that Wednesday before, Wednesday, uh, the September 19th, I'll have a police chief, Bottles Falls Police Chief Ron Lake, right here on the show to talk a little bit about the efforts that the uh, law enforcement are, are working on and to talk about how we'll, we'll be able to find uh, opportunities for folks to drop off their prescription drugs. So stay tuned for that. Again, that's coming up on um, September 29th. It's Prescription Take Back Day, and we'll be on the show uh, talking with Ron Lake on September 19th. Finally, uh, let me quickly um, let you know about a National Family Day. It's just something that we're going to be strongly promoting over the next month, uh, in fact, uh, almost 30 days uh, from now. Um, 
what this is is a day to promote uh, having your having dinner with your family and what uh, what statistics tells us and what the research tells us is that uh, having dinner with your family on a nightly basis uh, reduces um, the substance substance abuse and misuse uh, with teens and so we're going to be promoting activities throughout the community um, uh, on that week on on Monday, September 24th, uh, called National Family Day, a day to have family, uh, uh, food and family. So take a look at our website. We're going to be starting to post some um, updates on our, on our Facebook page as well as our website. And uh, stay tuned for those activities coming up. So again, I want to thank you for uh, listening in and watching in. And uh, this is Parks Place Perspective. My name is Chad Simmons, and we'll see you again in September. Take care.